everyone, I'm Ivy Rivera. I'm a psychic medium, Taino Arawak. I run a school called the Ivy League Psychic Academy. Today we are talking about stop overgiving without the guilt. I'm a perfect example of this today. I am not going to feel guilty about running out of time today. I had extra clients. I had extra things to do. I didn't have time to eat. I'm tired. I could have guilted myself into pulling out the flat iron and tons of makeup and finding an outfit. And I said, no, this is it. This is where I am right now. This fits in with the topic today. And sometimes you just have to show up and that's good enough. Okay, so that's where we are. But <laughs> what's really important here is that we analyze why it is that we overgive in general. I think that we are at a place in our society, especially here in America, where we have to start asking those questions about self-sabotage, victimization, and why it is that we don't have a healthy set of boundaries with our ourselves. Where did all of that training come from? Why are we in such a broken down system that we're stressed, exhausted, broke? We have no health care. How did we get here? Okay, what is going on? Now, one of the things that I want you guys to start looking at in your everyday lives is the root issue, not only out in society, but also within your family dynamics. I think that the main source of complication when we talk about lack of boundaries, trouble staying in your lane, guilt, shame, basic toxic negativity toward oneself, it's really almost like a self-hatred, right? Self-neglect. I think that most of the time that is coming from a family dynamic. So we are looking at generational issues. Now, many of us were probably raised by people who either came from overseas or or they lived through the Great Depression, or there was slavery in our past. And any issue, when we look back at the great-grandparents that they had, does unfortunately get passed down. It's important to look back at the habits especially in regards to work ethic, poverty, and overgiving with others and see where that came from. When you heal yourself, you stop these habits, you bring ancestral healing to your bloodline. I want to talk first about three key areas, okay? Four really, where I have watched myself, my family, my clients, my students, repeatedly struggle in these areas. And I want to start with work. One of the things that we are so guilted into, again, especially if you're in America here, is this toxic work mentality. If you are not working yourself to the bone, if you are not constantly busy, if you're not working yourself to death, if you're not a workaholic, you're lazy you're somehow dysfunctional, you're not achieving. And so many people are working themselves to death and not really achieving anything anyways. So we don't live within a system that focuses on fruition for the hard work, karmic payout. It's more of a cyclical, out of control, Ferris wheel type of uh, mouse on a wheel mentality where you never get off, you never get sick days, you never get paid leave, you don't get vacation, you don't have things that would help you to stay healthy and balanced. We don't get these things, so we automatically get brainwashed into thinking, well, we just have to work harder in order to, like, earn it or have it, okay? And there are many other countries where that's automatic. If you get sick, that time is paid. That's not limited. It's not like, well, I only get five sick days. No, you're paid. You get money while you're sick from that company. There are many other systems in the world where... People are cared for. That is not the mentality here in America. And I think that the workaholism mentality definitely goes back several generations to a time when people lived through the Great Depression and were told to be grateful for work. Be grateful for your work. You never complain. You suck it up. You show up. Even if you hate it, you attend, you retire from there. These are not healthy goals. <laughs> we have got to get this honorable idea, this concept of honor connected to workaholism out of our heads, out of our minds once and for all. So I also think that there's a lot of trouble with people who overwork to avoid themselves to avoid what they're actually needing to process mentally, emotionally, physically, socially, sexually. We just work because it's considered honorable. So the rest of society feeds that defective behavior. So we need to take a look 
at what our work habits are. Some of you maybe just find that you can't put the work away. You bring your work home with you, you lay down at night, and all you do is think about what you have to do or what's left over, what you did that day. A lot of you even dream that you're working literally all night long. You're just working, working, working. And we have got to put some boundaries on this. There is a healthy amount of work you should be engaged in. And then there is toxic workaholism. You need to look at where you are overgiving in the workplace. I think a lot of people too overwork because they're not living on their life path. They're not living within their true calling and they're not doing any work that feeds their soul. So it's almost like overeating. Okay, let's compare it to that. So sometimes people who have a tendency to overeat, they don't taste their food. They don't enjoy their food. They just gobble so quickly. They shovel it in. And it's almost like a race to beat the clock. And they're full. And they don't stop when they're full. They just keep shoveling it in until they're literally sick. Health issues and weight issues. Well, that's what a lot of people are doing with their work. Because they aren't actually investing their time and energy into what they should be. Now that has everything to do with your life contract. That has everything to do with your life path. Some people may call it like a soul contract. If you look at your numerology, if you look at your astrology, if you get a life contract reading with me, we can look and see what it is that you came to earth to do. But I assure you, if you're not doing that work, you're going to feel empty and you're going to fill it up with busyness, doing something you may have no business whatsoever doing. That's someone else's job. That's someone else's career. We got to get off that hamster wheel. Another area where people are doing this most commonly is in love, love partnerships, romantic partnerships, marriage for sure. But I see it more commonly these days, even in lesser relationships than that, where people don't want to leave a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And so often what I see is that we have someone with drug and alcohol abuse issues. When I'm seeing this with my clients and and my students, and even again, you know, even through my own family, I see weird patterns of this. There is an unwillingness usually for the overgiver to see their love partner clearly. They want to put on rose colored glasses. They want to make excuses. They want to enable, they want to deny the fact that this individual has maybe drug and alcohol abuse issues or Peter Pan syndrome. They're not willing to grow. They're not willing to be held accountable for their life or take responsibility. Or maybe their lover is abusive in some way. They don't want to admit that that's who that person is and that it will never be enough. The overgiver is willing to sacrifice everything they want, everything they need in a love partnership to, I guess, just spend time with this person, to just be there, to enable this person. Okay, so now we're getting into areas of codependency. Why would you want that for yourself? It's not really even about the other person. It's about you not loving yourself. It's about you not seeing yourself as a whole individual. You think you have this other half. That is also part of the brainwashing system that goes down throughout our history, especially for the ladies that you were told that's what you were supposed to do. You're supposed to find your other half. You know, this was a, a goal you were supposed to have accomplished by your like mid twenties. This is, that's ridiculous. You don't need any of that. So we have to get out again, look at the roots. Where did you learn to put yourself in a position where you were over giving, caretaking, parenting essentially over someone when it was supposed to be a partnership. We want partnerships. Go get a partnership and don't settle for less. So the love area is a huge problem where people over give. Now there's also an overwhelming sense of guilt that comes with that. If you feel you've abandoned that person, often people who have latched on, they're almost like, you know, emotional vampires, or they may literally be acting as vampires. Once they've latched on to you in love, if you say you're going to leave or you take actual steps to leave, they may deliberately deteriorate. Now they lost their job. Now they're having a mental health breakdown. And, you know, now they've fallen off the wagon, whatever it is, this is not a call for you to go back. This is obvious at that point that you need to set those boundaries and keep them set, continue to move forward. Too many people set boundaries or say they're going to set boundaries and then don't have follow through. With lovers, we have to be mindful and we may have past life issues there. Often in toxic love situations like that, I'm able to read the relationship and go back and see that in a past life, 
maybe the overgiver was actually the parent to this person. And now they're recreating that, that sick relationship. Okay. And that's not what it's meant to be in this life. In this life, you are meant to resolve issues, not relive them. Let's move on to category number three. That is your, with your children, with your kids. Too many parents overgive with their children and the guilt is absolutely overwhelming. We have got to stop seeing our children as an extension of ourselves. You could have four kids and put the same amount of time, attention and energy into them and love them all and never pick a favorite and you could have one or two of them that still kind of go off the rails. Two that are that do great work and are super stable. You just don't know what you're going to get because they have free will. They are individuals. You can't control these things. You also can't stop your children from getting hurt. I don't care for most parents' answer when it's like, what do you want for your kids? I want them to be happy and healthy. I want them to be happy and healthy. How realistic is that on planet Earth? Planet Earth which is a battleground, which is a classroom, which is about trial, which is about growing and stretching and learning lessons, mostly through pain and discomfort. How realistic then is that as a life goal for your kids? So if that's all you want for your children is for them to be happy and healthy, you're going to fall into this overgiving category and you're gonna have tremendous guilt when you can't deliver that for them. And that is not your job. That is never going to be a reality for them full time. Happiness and joy, patience and things like this, right? These are like virtues. We actually learn them through the trial process. We have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. So be realistic about what your job is as a parent and stop overgiving with your children. You are quite possibly handing down these generational problems yet again, these unattainable, unrealistic, right? Idealistic goals. Now, you don't want your kids to live that way. And you shouldn't always feel like a failure as a parent. What's important, I think, for parents to realize, if you're an overgiver, is that we have something called the kid contract. I call the kid contract. I'm writing a book on this. That means that your children signed on to you before they came to earth in the same way that you chose your parents. Some of you hear that and you think, I definitely did not choose my parents. Yes, you did, but that's another class. So when we choose our parents, we've chosen them typically for a couple key reasons. We have work that we need to get done. And those adults are going to help us get to that place. Now, sometimes they're horrible parents and they help us get to that place by strengthening us, by not giving us what we need, what we deserve. And we have to go get it for ourselves. Those are the leaders of the world. Those are the healers of the world. Those are the light workers of the world. But some of us are born into average families where the parents have certain skill sets, you know, characters, personality, you know, characteristics. And the child knows that that parent will help them through that personality and character. We don't want to lose that. Too many people have kids and they forget who they are. That's not why they signed on to you. Now, these contracts are not necessarily lifelong. So you could bring a child through, raise it for a while, and that's sort of the end of the contract. And that's okay. Now, I want to talk also category number four, and then we are going to um, move on to solutions here. Okay, so category number four, where do we overgive? What I see with my clients and my students mostly is that this is happening with family. So whether you have a parentification situation where maybe you were born into a family where you had a parent who was like a narcissist, an alcoholic, had maybe mental health issues, or was like physically ill, or there was only one parent or whatever. If you were born into a situation where you had to become the parent, you became the caretaker, you became the adult, you never got to have a childhood, this would be particularly difficult for you. Not only to stop overgiving with your family or that parent, but in all areas of your life. So you need to examine again where the root is. Sometimes we're just born into families that guilt. There are plenty of stereotypes, right? Polly over here is an Italian, so I could pick on him. That Italian stereotype. What is it? The Italian guilt or the Italian mother guilt or whatever? Well, that's just one example. This is common in many cultures where you're not even able to think for yourself. You should never step out of line. Your parents have provided for you. They have a destination for you career-wise, and you are to fulfill those goals, and you are to be of service to them. Well, this is toxic, obviously, right, for one's 
um, identity and independence. We need to break free. We also, we also find that there's a lot of guilt and overgiving within family dynamics where there are certain maybe dysfunctional members and because there's so much worry and there's so much hope that that they will somehow turn their lives around it ends up becoming this big system of entanglement where everyone's sort of sucked into the toxicity of it we can see a lot of triangulation people talking behind other people's backs you know teams forming and things like this none of this is healthy at some point you may just need to step away a lot of people have been experiencing this here in the states especially throughout 2020 we were talking about this at church the other day where in 2020 you know we saw many many families break apart many close relationships that have been there for a long long time because there were some members that were feeding dark energy. They were feeding hatred or racism. And, and that's painful to watch. It's painful to have to stand up and say, you know what? I'm done with my father. I'm done with my aunts and uncles. I'm done with my toxic cousins. I'm, I'm done with these childhood friends. I have a more realistic, truthful, healthy mentality that we're all one. And anyone who's going against that and trying to destroy others is so toxic. I, I literally can't even entertain having a social life with them anymore. And I'm going to set boundaries. I'm going to keep them set. We saw a ton of that in 2020. And this is a tough area too. Okay. So we need to be realistic that we are not here to fix anybody the only way to show them what they should be thinking or saying or contributing to is to live by example and sometimes that requires you stepping back and saying i'm not feeding your toxicity i'm gonna stay over here i'm gonna shine with the other humans for what's best for the world that's where i stand now sometimes that means a whole lot more than anything so one of the things i like to do is to reach out to my members and to say what areas are you suffering in? What would you like for me to add to the curriculum? And we did have a member, Amy, who said, it's hard for me to discern whether or not I should be helping someone in a situation or if I should just be staying in my lane, especially because I'm a light worker. Do you have any tips on how to know when to give and when to pull back? How do we know when we're meant to assist and when we are meant to keep to ourselves? So that is a great question. I already have a mini class on this here on YouTube that I would recommend you watch. It's called How to Check Your Ego in light work and beyond. So this is for every day, everybody, but it's also designed for light workers. So you can see that in the playlist. Now that's gonna break down literal situations and how the battle tends to arise. What we want to make sure we do, if we are unsure whether or not we should help somebody, is to pull your energy back. And I would spend about 10 minutes going in and asking your joy guide. Your joy guide is your spirit spiritual development guide, your joy guide watches over your mental and emotional well-being. Your joy guide is your right-hand man or woman and is always waiting there to show you yay or nay. If it's a free will zone and you don't seem to get any kind of answer, it's up to you. But you may want to be watchful, mindful of the situation as you go forward. So ask if you don't know whether you should or not. Ask, ask at all times. Now, one of the ways I know if I'm supposed to help someone, let's use the example of the scholarship program here at the Academy. I get a lot of people reach out who want to be part of the scholarship program. They don't want to have to pay for the classes, the psychic mediumship classes. So they'll say, I think you should give back to us by giving me free classes. And eh, you're not it. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're not at all. However, Spirit will typically show me ahead of time that someone is approaching and that that person would offer to be of service and want to be part of the scholarship program. I be, how can I be of service and be a part of this? I can't afford it right now, right? There are ways if you are being mindful regularly as a light worker or as just anyone out in the world every day, you can listen ahead of time and pay attention to those in your life and situations where you know it could be confusing. You should be shown first when you're supposed to give, especially if it's going to be beyond your comfort zone. You should be shown first. Now, you would also notice that you feel positive about it. You feel at peace. Maybe you feel nothing versus 
a terrible foreboding, a feeling of dread, or something wrong. Burning at the back of your neck, up into your head, sort of a sick feeling, anxiety attacks, any kind of a denial of the other person's energy where you just don't want to be near them at all. If something is really feeling off, maybe you're not supposed to be giving there. I would also say that the third thing you should check is the fluidity of the whole situation. So I find that when people are always coming to me, for example, and like one more question, one more question, one more question, you know, and just constantly needy and they have a victimhood mentality and they never apply anything I offer them. That's not the one to help. There should be a fluidity to it. They should come with an open energy, an open heart and a willingness to take responsibility, accountability for their lives. If you feel that, it's probably okay. Okay, so we don't want to overcomplicate that, but how to check your ego in light work and beyond will help you. Amy, that's a great question. Thank you. A couple key things to remember. How can we fix this? Keep these things in mind. Number one, every time you're approaching a mark where you're going to overstep your boundaries, you're going to go outside your lane, it's a test. You're being tested. I have a class up here on YouTube called Fighting the Dark that you want to check out. Every new level, there's a new devil. Okay, Every time a door is going to open, another door has to shut. We don't level up in any area of our lives without being tested. And these tests can easily be failed when it comes to overgiving because of the guilt and because backpedaling has become so habitual. So you better be careful. Now, this isn't just coming in the form of like, necessarily giving somebody money or going out of your way and aban abandoning your own schedule. It's simple things often, like how much time and energy are you giving to this person mentally? Are you worried about them? Are you thinking about them? Are you helicoptering over them? Or do you respond to that text? Do you respond to that message, that phone call when you know you shouldn't have? Pay attention. It's in the subtle detail. And we also have this concept of being brainwashed. So this is number two. How can you feed ancestral healing. Where did the brainwashing come from in society or your family? Where did the programming come from? And your guilt shouldn't come from not feeding that toxicity, that system. It should come from feeding it and knowing that you're actually passing this handicap down to future generations. If you want to be the one who brings ancestral healing to your bloodline, to future generations, you've got to break the programming and okay? that will break the chains. So number three, here's something you should know. This should help you with your guilt. It's an illusion that you're helping anyways. That is something you have mastermind to feel better about yourself or the people that you're dealing with, the situation that you're tied up in. If you are giving when you shouldn't, then you are enabling, you are codependent, you're self-destructive, and you should feel more guilt about that. A lot of people have what I call the wounded healer syndrome. A lot of people have heard of this, but maybe don't know what it is. I did a video up on TikTok recently. And if you fall into this category, check out my class, Stay in Your Lane, here on YouTube. You may also want to check out Intuition, versus emotion because what happens is your emotion comes in and sometimes even your logic comes in and it wipes out your gut instinct it wipes out your intuition and you go the wrong way get a handle on it so wounded healer syndrome is about needing to heal yourself needing to do the shadow work and heal your inner child your dysfunctional habits but instead all you do is nitpick over everybody else you get your hands in everybody else's business that's wounded healer syndrome number four if you're going to feel guilt you should feel it over the fact that you're overgiving and abandoning yourself you're abandoning your prosperity because law of attraction and manifestation does not work when you're overgiving. You should feel it over the dysfunctional ways in which you are contributing, whether this be with your family, your friends, society, your kids. You should also know you have karmic kickback coming from that. So when we talk about karmic kickback, it's not just that you take on the bad karma from the individual who's doing wrong. 
It's that they get it and you get it. So it's like a double karmic kickback. When I tell my clients, do not cross that line, that is a boundary. You should not be over giving or enabling or helping this person anymore. It's not good. You're going to get karmic kickback. I often get blown off. Well, karma, karma is just an illusion. Karma is not, karma is a very real thing. And it is, sometimes it takes a minute, but sometimes it is instantaneous. All of a sudden you're hitting every red light. All of a sudden the phone stops ringing and business is drying up. All of a sudden you're having health issues. All of a sudden everything goes wrong. Everything goes wrong. If you are caught up in a toxic cycle, it's possibly karmic kickback from you over giving in other areas of your life. You want to feel guilt? Feel guilt that you're doing that to yourself. Stop that. You should also, if you're going to feel guilt, let's talk about number five, lacking accountability. You, you're not accountable. Who could hold you? You're not holding yourself accountable. This doesn't allow you to be, let's look at number six, in a leadership position. Okay? If you don't know how to own your own energy, if you don't know how to set boundaries, if you don't have healthy follow through or balance, how could you lead others? Number seven, you want to feel guilty about something? Feel guilty that there's a lack of integrity going on in your life. You want to have integrity. You want for your word to mean something. You want to be the kind of person who can mentor over others, help other people, grow and expand, feed the light. You can't do that when you're caught up in this toxic cycle. And number eight, you're going to feel guilty, feel guilty about sloughing off your own true responsibilities because it is your responsibility to protect yourself to guard your energy and to do what is right for you in self love, self respect. This is about accountability. And every time you say, eh, 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 I'm just going to keep over giving. It's easier this way. You're shrugging all of that off and there are no benefits to that. Okay. That should make you feel more guilt than giving in to a negative system that never goes anywhere. I just also want to say this in conclusion before I get to any questions or comments here. I think that one of the things that's going on with people who don't want to stop with the overgiving is that they are afraid of their own achievements. Is it possible that you're afraid of leveling up? Okay, we have another class on that, your fear of leveling up. Is it possible you just want to stay in that comfortable zone with those toxic people or in that toxic situation because you're afraid of what you may become. And often with that comes challenges and with that comes all this newness, having to make new relationships and rebuild your life. Yeah, it's a level up. But if you think of life like a video game, remember Cubert? <laughs> Who's old? Cubert, the big thing with, yeah, I hated Cubert because I never got very far. But I was always thrilled if I was able to get up to the next level. And it was probably only like one of the first two or three levels. But how everything changed. Everything changed. And I was like, this is life. This is the perfect metaphor for life. On a new level, it's like you've got new cherries to eat, new ghosts to grab, and you've got new player, you got new people who, new tools you know, new swords, new whatever, everything is different. And the atmosphere itself is different. Everything that you leave behind gets replaced with something much better if you're doing it for the right reasons. It's level up, yeah? Look at Pac-Man, okay? Like that was way easier. All you really needed for Pac-Man and Miss Pac-Man was speed. And it didn't really change tremendously, you know, but there were other games that, that did. So pff, you stay in the easy lane, yeah. Be more comfortable, but it's not the same payout. Well, you you know you overgive by wanting to help the overgiver. How do you help him stop? You you don't. You live by example. So there's again no way to help someone with their dysfunctional habits necessarily. You could point it out. Um, which you've probably done. You could maybe send him a book or send him this link. You can show him by example. I think that one of the healthiest things any of us can do, one of the most productive ways to handle a situation like this is to keep shining, keep smiling, keep enjoying yourself. So that means that when he's down and out and he's drained and he's having a miserable time, you don't go, oh, my poor brother, I'm going to lower my happiness and joy level and I'm going to drag my face. I'm not going to smile. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to be here for him. No, keep shining. Keep dancing. Okay. Keep doing your thing. 
I've earned this. Look at all the energy I have from doing me. You know, you give within healthy boundaries. And if he doesn't understand how to do that, he needs to suffer and feel the energy of that drain and have you as an example of the polar opposite of that. I, I honestly, though, do feel just intuitively with him, he may need some therapy. We need to sometimes talk these things out with a good therapist and find out, again, what are the root issues here? Where did he learn to overgive like that? And sometimes until we get to that root issue, we continue to struggle in major ways with us, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So when I was talking earlier about the lovers, that's one of the areas where I see it, but I also see it with the money and the work. So if we are born into a life where, again, we're with a lover who was a child in a previous life, we will all often see a dysfunctional relationship where one person, the kid, right, feels entitled to take from the other partner and the parent, the parent partner feels guilt if they refuse that. And so, yeah, it's this dysfunctional, you can see it with people when like, I can look at a couple and I could just be like, Oh my God, that's a mother and a son, you know? And like the husband just gives everything to her, everything. And all she does is take, 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 take. And it's, it's, it's gross. You know, it is, it's gross. It's a weird codependent toxicity. And you would see it there. You would also see it, especially again, with the work and the money. If you in a previous life really suffered with poverty, or if you were robbed, or if you were like in a position where you had wealth and then it was removed from you in some way, all of that can lead to an almost like hoarding mentality in this life where you um, just want to collect things. You feel real nervous about job security all the time. You never step out and go in new directions because your money's got to be there. You have an overwhelming sense of guilt, even with things like, you know, I have to pay the mortgage. I have to pay for the kids. Even if maybe like your spouse says to you, it's okay, go back to school. This is what you passionately want to do. We'll make it happen. We'll make it work. And, and you just can't, you just can't relax. That could be past life trauma for sure. Well, and that might just be healthy. I mean, you know, <laughs> to a degree, I think that's healthy. I think when we don't have a sense of like control and prosperity and like, you know, we're just dysfunctional because we're not doing anything with our lives. That could be more about your mental health and well-being than a past life trauma. But, you know, definitely when you can't stop and you're overdoing it and you won't allow yourself to pursue things that would make you happier or that you're passionate about, you could be stuck. It'd be fun to get more um, information out of you on that. But I think one of the important things for, for you and anyone listening to her comment here is to examine your life. At different times, you're going to have all kinds of you know, it just sort of becomes like a big shit show, you know, and you're like, what, what is going on? What went wrong? Well, there are transitional periods, there are detoxing phases where that's going to happen. Like I said, new level, new devil, a new door to open, another door has to shut. That's fine. But there are other times when it is definitely karmic, so to speak, which means that whatever you put out is coming back at you. And you can study this in other people's lives. That's an easy way to start sort of taking notes on how it works. But I think it's really important to figure out first, is this is this a natural part of the process? Am I going through a transitional phase and I have to detox? Or is it karmic? And if it is karmic, I would check here first. Is there some area in your life where you were giving and you weren't supposed to. Did you get out of your lane? Did you cross a boundary knowing you shouldn't have? It often goes right directly back here. And I like Jill's comment too on how, yeah, it's not helping anybody. And this is a common problem I see with my students is that they want to overgive and overgive and overgive and overgive to clients who don't care, are just trying to get readings or healings out of them for free, who aren't going to give anything back and aren't going to take the information and apply it to their lives anyways. And and they just want more and more and more. And the world is a vampire. The world will literally suck the soul right out of you if you allow it to happen. So we need to be careful, especially as healers and light workers, that we're mindful of that reality, that battle at all times. And we're always saying, oh, no, you're not getting a thing out of me unless I know intuitively or spirit has told me that I am to give you something from my from my energy field. And that is perfectly acceptable. Anything less is dangerous. And I will just say this in closing, this is time 
especially here in 2021 and here in America, but internationally with the pandemic and everything going on, where we can learn a lot about healthy giving and unhealthy overgiving and to do things responsibly in your life every day in a conscientious way, conscientious way. So you're not just doing for you, you're doing for the whole, you will feel better in those instances where you need to pull your energy back and say, No, I really can't give that right now I need to do for me. Is it possible that some of you that overgive are actually selfish in a lot of other other areas because it's it's got to be imbalanced in other places and so maybe you don't care about anybody else and you are cutting corners in other places start doing better in everything that you do and don't forget that you're part of a much bigger group and that will help a lot too thank you so much for tuning in everybody thank you polly you're very well thank you spirit